Okay, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks to Hachin for organizing. Um, in the interest of time, and especially because I think we have uh, panelists whose many whose uh, reputations really precede, uh, precede them, um, I'm not going to do long introductions. I'm just going to do uh, kind of short ones so that we make sure that we leave lots of time for questions um, and discussion at the end. So uh, we have four great presenters today, um, all of whom have done terrific work in this area, and I think who are going to bring uh, really interesting perspectives. Uh, first is Professor Pam Samuelson, who is the Richard M. Sherman Distinguished Professor of Law and Information at the UC Berkeley School of Law. Uh, then will be Professor Mark Lemley, the William H. Newcomb Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Uh, professor Houchin Sun, who's doing double duty tonight, uh, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. And finally, but uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Professor Karis Craig, who's Associate Professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School. Um, so I think uh, we're going to operate basically the same way as the previous uh, panel. Each of uh, our speakers is going to speak for about 15 minutes. Please feel free to put some questions in the Q&A, um, which I will uh, monitor as we're going, and then we'll uh, take up Q&A at the end of all the presentations. So uh, Professor Samuelson, over to you. So good evening to me and good day to the rest of you. Um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, the title of my talk is AI Copyrights, A Toy Problem No Longer. Um, and uh, let me say a little bit about why uh, I think it has been a kind of toy problem until quite recently. Uh, so. I actually have done the, the research to you know that since the mid 1960s, Congress has been kind of like, oh my God, what are we going to do with computer generated works uh, that um, AI programs might be able to develop? Uh, so that came up during the time when Congress in the United States was trying to revise the 1909 Act uh, to come up with this modern um, uh, 1976 Act. And it was one of several computer related uh, issues that, uh, that Congress was like unsure what to do. Um, and the new technology issues were kind of holding up enactment of the, what became the 1976 act. Um, and so they spun off uh, this set of uh, computer related issues uh, to this Contu commission, the new commission, uh, the the Commission on New Technological Uses of, co of Copyrighted Works. And so, you know, copyrightability of computer generated works was one of those topics. Com copyrightability of computer programs uh, was one of those topics. Uh, copyrightability of databases was uh, one of the topics. And whether inputting um, a copyrighted work into a computer was a copyright relevant reproduction. Um, and the, the uh, uh, the Contu Commission kind of met for uh, a few years uh, and then decided that actually um, computer programs uh, are just tools. They're like cameras. And the user of the tool is always going to be the author. There's no reason whatsoever uh, to think about and worry about AI authorship. Um, uh, they also recommended copyright for computer programs, which, as we know, has been another like little place where there's been a morass. Um, uh, computer databases, I think, of the Contu uh, recommendations, this was one of the more sensible ones, as long as there is some creativity in the selection and arrangement uh, of uh, data in a database uh, that can uh, qualify for copyright protection. And it wasn't really until the Authors Guild v. Hottie Trust case uh, in 2014 uh, that we saw a court really address the question about uh, whether it was copyright infringement to input the contents of a uh, copyrighted material uh, into a, a computer. Uh, so this was basically a report that came out uh, in 1979 um, and uh, was very modern for, our, uh, for its time. Um, but in the 1980s, kind of coming off the Contu report, um, there was further debate about what to do. The Office of Technology Assessment uh, of the US Congress that used to write reports to on kind of new technology issues to provide some insights for 
Congress, uh, they basically came out and said, well, maybe it's going to be the program and the user uh, who will be joint authors of uh, these computer generated uh, works. I wrote a paper in 1985, published in 1986, but back then it was a toy problem, right? There were no commercially significant um, uh, poems or stories or videos or photographs or images of any sort uh, that were, um, you know, that were a reason why you would really care about what the answer to that question uh, might be. Uh, and of course, in the 1980s, there were similar kinds of articles about, ooh, computer generated patents. Uh, and um, uh, so it was one of those things where it was intellectually quite interesting, but really not a big deal. Uh, and so, um, so here was in the 1980s, this kind of set of uh, papers that were written about this uh, issue, many of which took completely different uh, points of view uh, about whether what the right answer to the question was, uh, but it didn't really matter um, what the right answer was because it wasn't important. Uh, so now we come up with, uh, now I have to say this particular picture, um, somebody paid $432,000 $500 for this particular computer generated work. Me, I would not pay a dime for it, but you know what? Somebody did and there it is, okay? But to me, the kind of the, the nice example of what might be computer generated art that actually is meaningful and that we should be thinking about. And maybe this AI generated stuff is no longer a toy problem is the next Rembrandt. So if you haven't ever seen the video about the making of the next Rembrandt, I do highly recommend it. It's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice example of uh, what computers can do. Now, what they did is they basically scanned all of the Rembrandt paintings that they could find uh, so that they had kind of representative um, paintings uh, of various kinds of figures uh, and then uh, they basically studied each of the, uh, the eyes and the nose and the mouth and uh, certain things like hats and, and lace. And they basically then decided to kind of create the next Rembrandt. And so this is the, this is the image of the next Rembrandt that Rembrandt didn't actually do. I think you can all see that it looks a lot like a Rembrandt. And so if you didn't know any difference, you pay, probably would say, hey, that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a Rembrandt painting, only it isn't, but it's taking things from various of the, uh, of the Rembrandt paintings and like assembling them in a way that now uh, makes for a beautiful new picture. Um, and who owns copyright in that? Uh, is uh, one of the questions that I think it's like fun to answer. Now, I think a much bigger part of the AI generated works that have some commercial value are coming out in music. So David Bowie actually worked with UMG to create kind of a random generator of, um, of words, of lyrics for, uh, for music uh, and various other um, uh, services, and uh, now Spotify is a good example, right? They, they have already a huge database of um, popular music. And so that's a training set, right? That's a training data for uh, generating uh, new music. And it actually produced at least uh, one uh, hit single. And an advantage of this um, is that they don't have to pay royalties to, uh, uh, to the copyright owners because if it's anybody, it's them. Um, and so we see that actually there's lots going on. And of course, um, uh, many other kinds of commercial AI outputs are producing um, uh, sort of types of output. Uh, and so there are three principal questions. I think that this uh, raises for copyright law. So one is 
whether the making of digital copies of copyrighted works as training data um, uh, might infringe the copyright in the underlying works. I'm not gonna talk about that because Mark Lemley's going to, um, uh, but whether the copyright and the AI software extends to AI generated outputs uh, uh, that are copyright subject matter, um, uh, is that a derivative work? Um, there's actually two cases that have uh, that have addressed that, and I'll I'll speak about them briefly. And then, of course, the big question about um, who owns the copyright and the outputs uh, that are copyright subject matter um, is a human author necessary? Um, which human should be deemed the author, and where does the originality lie? Um, so, the design data versus Unigate case. Uh, was decided by the Ninth Circuit um, a few years ago. So Design Data owns copyright in CAD software for generating drawings and data and models for essentially steel structural engineering um, uh, designs. Uh, and uh, Design Data basically said, hey, Unigate imported and sold to American customers CAD outputs that had been generated by a Chinese firm that illegally used the uh, design data software um, and said that that's actually, um, that that's a derivative work. And the Ninth Circuit said, no, I don't think so, right? And so some part of it is that the design data um, outputs um, didn't bear any resemblance to the underlying program. So the court said, mm, I don't think so. Um, uh, Reardon versus, well, Disney Company uh, is another actually really interesting uh, case because Reardon basically develops some software uh, that captures the motions of actors and their performances uh, and kind of makes these like little um, models. Um, and then um, Disney and um, other companies could basically um, project kind of like cartoon-like characters. Um, so that Beauty and the Beast, for example, use the Reardon MOVA software. Um, and Disney basically moved to dismiss the derivative work infringement claim uh, because they said that, you know, the substantial contributions to the movies really were provided by the actors and the directors um, and by Disney, not by the, uh, not by the MOVA software. Uh, and both cases actually cite to a district court opinion, Torosoft versus Strasnan, um, that recognized the possibility that software outputs could infringe software copyrights. Um, but the test that uh, the Drosnan case adopted, which Design Data and Reardon both adopted too, is where is the lion's share of the creativity in whatever the output is. And I think lion's share is not exactly a very helpful way of thinking about it, but that's the, the, that's the test that's been out there uh, so far. Um, uh, obviously, uh, AI software can uh, produce computer generated works that are categorically eligible for copyright protection. Um, and of course, they generate many things that are not copyright protected. Um, the registers of copyright always have said no, 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 including uh, quite recently, human authorship is absolutely essential. Um, but now we have the kind of patent office and copyright office and WIPO trying to like, oh my God, um, we have to actually address these issues. Um, and uh, the closest that we find in the uh, in the U.S. case law is kind of the Naruto versus Slater case. So the monkey selfie was not copyrightable because there was no human author. Um, the, uh, the office refused registration of the individual photos. There are also a set of uh, automatic writing cases that uh, Anne-Marie Bridey wrote about in her recent article about this issue. So if you think that Jesus was actually speaking to you when you wrote down something and you, in some sense, think of Jesus as the author, the Copyright Office is going to accept that. So they re-registered and basically claimed uh, that uh, the church basically 
um, was the translator, or made some editorial decisions. Um, and so the kind of on translation, editorial decisions and selection and arrangement, uh, courts have basically been willing so far. Uh, again, there are very few cases, um, uh, but they have been willing to say that you know, the human that basically did the translation or the selection and arrangement uh, was the person who, uh, who owned the copyright. Um, and having studied the literature, both from the 1980s and most recently, everybody thinks that it's somebody else. Um, and so even the Office, Office of Technology Assessment in 1986 said, hey, maybe programs are co-authors um, uh, with the users or the programmers with, um, whatever copyrights there might be. And of course there are sui generis rights um, in the UK and some of the Commonwealth com countries that have a short term uh, 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 th form of intellectual property protection, uh, kind of copyright like, but not exactly the same as copyright. Um, and so, um, you know, there are only two cases that I know of that have addressed this issue in China. Um, one had to do with, um, uh, an analytic report uh, about the film and entertainment industry. Um, the report was generated by, um, uh, by AI software. And the court in that case basically said, no copyright in AI generated outputs. They're not works within the meaning of copyright law. There's no author. Um, and they said that AI software um, uh, generated works have to identify themselves as AI generated so that you know that actually uh, they're not uh, protected uh, by copyright law. But insofar as a human um, modifies the AI outputs and colors or otherwise enhances um, the, the work, then that would be a basis for claiming some copyright protection. So if that gets copied, uh, that could be uh, infringement. Another of the cases basically said that an article that AI software had developed about stock about the stock market um, was actually copyrightable by the firm that developed the software. So that's another way of thinking about it. Uh, and with respect to the, uh, the next Rembrandt, I think you have to look at um, all of the participants in the uh, in the in the process um, uh, and you know, maybe they decided how to handle um, intellectual property rights of any through contract. Um, uh, that's what I would probably do if I were in their shoes. But, um, but you know, the Meshworks uh, versus Toyota case, which held no copyright protection in 3D models of uh, Toyota cars, um, really suggests that there might not be any originality out there. Um, and um, I guess, a couple of last uh, points. Um, one of the things that I think is important to recognize uh, is that um, AI software is not just a, a black box. And we think of it as a black box, but it's not. There are lots of different components, including training data, weights to be given to them, models, algorithms, know-how of the software, and software that it executes. So different people basically provide that input. So maybe, in fact, it's more complicated than just, hey, there's one entity that should uh, actually be able to get it. I think this is my last uh, slide, which is the state of AI technology today um, is such that they can do things within genre, right? So if you want to like make a Taylor Swift-like song, you can probably do that, but they can't do, they can't be the next Taylor Swift. So, um, uh, you know, it's important to kind of understand the limitations of AI software uh, as well as its uh, opportunities. So with that, I think I will uh, hand the baton back to somebody else. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Pam. Uh, Professor Mark Lemley is up next, and that's a good segue from uh, Pam's reference to the training data. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, I am uh, going to switch gears a little get, bit from what most people have uh, talked about in this conference. Uh, so rather than the outputs uh, of AI, uh, I'm going to talk about the inputs. Machine learning depends critically on large sets of training data. Um, good facial recognition stop sign recognition, natural language recognition, translation, speech generation, 
Uh, all of these things depend on having a, a good, capable set of training data uh, so that we can get a, a, a good output. Uh, some companies already have access to this data. Uh, often those are incumbents in another market. Google happens to have a collection of lots and lots of language information uh, because of its business. Facebook has a large collection of images uh, that it could use for image recognition. But new entrants are gonna have to build or license databases that include this training data. And while some large data sets are just data, they are just pieces of information that are not themselves protectable, uh, think of stock prices, for instance, or maybe the raw inputs for uh, weather AI. Uh, the vast majority of the training data sets are in fact large collections of copyrighted works. Anything that uses text, anything that uses uh, facial recognition or images, anything that uh, uses <clears throat> uh, mapping, uh, uh, there are a variety of different things that are gonna rely at some point uh, on building a corpus of things and the individual parts of the corpus uh, are copyrighted works. So what Brian Casey and I uh, are concerned with is whether and under what circumstances the use of those uh, works is, is lawful. Uh, so far, data collection for search and for old fashioned text data mining has been held in the United States, at least generally to be fair use. Uh, the notable case here is the Google Books case in which Google was permitted to scan uh, all of a uh, corpus of, uh, uh, of multiple libraries in order to provide uh, search functionality uh, and uh, deliver snippets of the books. It couldn't deliver the, uh, the books themselves, but it could identify a particular uh, text from the books to make them searchable. It's not obvious though that that uh, uh, same conclusion will apply to data collection and ingestion for machine learning. Um, uh, there are obvious similarities, but the, the situations are not the same. There's no copyrightable output at all in most cases. So the legal doctrine in the United States that's been used to conclude that um, uh, data collection for, for text and data mining is permissible, which is the transformative use uh, doctrine, uh, may get sidestepped. Uh, because it's not obvious that there's a transformation of a copyrighted work into another copyrighted work. There's a use of the copyrighted work, uh, but not a copyrightable output necessarily. Uh, there are also cases that seem to question or limit the scope of Google Books. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I am... It's not clear that those cases are in fact good law after the Supreme Court's decision in Oracle versus Google, uh, but, uh, but they are at least a risk. Uh, and I think there's also a risk because um, uh, attitudes towards uh, uh, tech companies have changed uh, in a pretty dramatic fashion in the last several years. Uh, and while that should not in theory influence the law, I think in practice it is likely to do so. Uh, so um, I don't want to suggest that uh, the, the law will conclude that these uses are not fair. I don't think it should conclude that, but I think there's at least a risk of it. Outside the United States, the situation is more varied. Uh, Europe, consistent with its more strongly copyright, uh, high protectionist approach, uh, had in fact held uh, a number of, in a number of cases that there was liability for using training data. Um, the, uh, the European Union also has a data protection uh, initiative for data aggregation that might apply. Uh, the Digital Markets Act uh, provides some more uh, uh, freedom and, and liberalization uh, for the use of training data. Uh, in Asia, uh, uh, Japan has actually quite a uh, uh, AI-friendly law uh, regarding the use of this data. Singapore is in the process of, uh, of doing something similar, uh, but there's certainly variation across, uh, across the countries. So what we suggest in the paper is um, uh, first that there are good policy reasons to support free access, open access to AI training data. Uh, we want good training data uh, for lots of reasons, right? We, it's gonna get us better AI, uh, but it's also going to get us, I think, um, AI that is more consistent with a number of the policy objectives of people who worry about some of the effects of AI. 
Uh, so if you want safer cars, uh, you should want everyone to have access to the best available training data for detecting pedestrians, for detecting stop signs, for uh, updating uh, for, for traffic or road conditions and the like. Uh, if you are concerned about the problem of bias in AI, you should want uh, the best and uh, broadest possible training data sets uh, in order to avoid uh, bad facial recognition that's biased against minority groups, in order to avoid uh, uh, skewed data sets uh, from bad inputs and so forth. We will not get that training data set if everybody has to get a license from all of the copyright owners, right? If I need a database of photographs of stop signs, um, I'm not gonna be able to go get a license from everybody who's got a photograph of a stop sign. I might get some, I might be able to identify some blocks of things, but the blocks of things that I'm gonna identify are gonna be non-representative. And so they're gonna increase the problem of uh, bias, increase the problem of uh, skew and potential flaws in, in, uh, in training data. Uh, the companies who already have access to that data um, uh, are in fact companies we might worry about having preferential or exclusive access to AI training data, right? They're the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. And so we might as a policy reason also want to support a broad right to access for AI training data um, be, in order to reduce competition threats. What we suggest in the paper is that as a matter of copyright law, uh, training for machine learning should be fair use under US copyright law uh, because the AI values the work in most cases, not for its creative aspects, but for the non-creative aspects. The goal of the training of the AI is reading text to learn the ideas or the connections, the semantic connections between words, not for the things that make the, the creative work expressive. The goal of uh, training uh, uh, on stop sign photographs is to recognize a stop sign, not to, uh, not to evaluate or appreciate the artistic uh, components of, of, the, of that photograph. But AI doesn't have the choice to take just the uncopyrightable components. It can't just take the facts. It can't just take the functional elements. We've got to ingest the whole thing. Uh, and so a copyright uh, lawsuit uh, would be capturing the value of the ideas and the functional elements, not the thing that makes the work copyrightable. We call this principle fair learning. What we suggest is that AIs should be permitted to engage in the copying of an entire work where the goal and value of the output that they get uh, is a result of the ideas or the functional components in that work and not the result of the expressive material. I should note that this won't always be true. Uh, so Pam gave some examples, for instance, if I wanna train uh, uh, an AI to, to develop a, a Rembrandt by feeding it a whole bunch of Rembrandts, that's probably okay because uh, long as copyright terms are, Rembrandt is still out of copyright. Uh, but if an AI copies all of, uh, all of Taylor Swift's works in order to figure out how to write a Taylor Swift song uh, or one that sounds like Taylor Swift, then it is in fact using the uh, expressive material, right? Not just the ideas or the functional elements of the, of the work. And that's something copyright law can properly be concerned with. But I think that's gonna be the small set of cases. In the vast majority of AI cases, you will need access to a training data set that training data set will consist of large numbers of copyrighted works. You're unlikely to be able to get a license to uh, all or most of those works if you have to do it on an individual basis. And the law can and should step in and say, this ought to be permissible uh, because it is not something that is directed at the heart of what copyright actually wants to protect. We are allowing you to take the very things and use the very things that copyright says are not unprotectable. I will note that this concept of fair learning has applications uh, beyond AI. It's not just AIs that engage in fair learning. Uh, there are lots of other uses made by humans uh, where the human is in fact just interested in the, in the facts or the ideas behind a work, but ends up taking more. Uh, in the Texaco case, for instance, the court held illegal the photocopying of a science uh, article by a scientist who was interested not in the 
artistic or expressive words in that article, but in the graphs uh, and the data that that article presented. The easiest way to get access to those uncopyrightable facts, though, was to make a photocopy of the whole thing. So even though the scientist was interested in the uncopyrightable elements, the fact that the uncopyrightable and the copyrightable were bound up together uh, made that act of copying an act of infringement. Um, human reading or analysis on computers often requires incidental copies. Uh, you have a right to read a book, but if you read that book in an electronic environment, you may find that it's impossible to avoid making copies, intermediate copies of those books, and at least some courts have held those uh, intermediate uh, or incidental copies to be unlawful. Uh, if you want to read the law, uh, in the United States or in other countries like uh, the UK, which have crown copyright, uh, uh, you may be faced with a lawsuit for having copied things that the state uh, or private entities that drafted the, uh, the law claim uh, ownership over, even though your interest is not in expression, but in the actual language uh, of what is permitted and what is prohibited. Uh, and if you want to copy newsworthy material, um, you may have no choice but to take a particular work that has exclusive access, the video of a particular shooting, the video of a particular uh, riot uh, taken by one person for which there was, isn't an accept, uh, acceptable substitute. Uh, we have other doctrines to protect some of this. Uh, some things we might declare uncopyrightable entirely uh, as, um, uh, as the US Supreme Court did in Georgia versus public resource uh, to a limited extent with respect to government uh, laws. Uh, but, uh, but we need, I think, a broader principle of fair learning to help us ensure that the promise that copyright law provides, which is we will protect the expression, but we will give the ideas and the facts to the public, can actually be effectuated in practice, that people can actually have effective access to those supposedly uncopyrightable elements and use them. Um, and finally, I'll note that the AI principle of fair learning uh, helps to remind us that there is um, uh, more to the fair use doctrine than, uh, than the transformative use that has taken over uh, our discussion of that doctrine in the last 25 years. Uh, the goal of fair use uh, and its uh, sisters in other countries is not merely protect transformation, protect the creation of new copyrighted works. It is protect uses of a copyrighted work that are in the public interest. Um, and doing that, uh, I think, uh, sometimes requires uh, the copying of an entire work in order to make a use that isn't one that copyright law should worry about. And with that, I will conclude. Great, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, Professor Hutchinson, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so um, as Mark mentioned earlier, I'm giving another talk at a conference. I'm actually not using my AI system to give the talk on my behalf. I'm actually doing so on my own because I authored a paper and I wanna present it uh, you know, uh, at the conference. So if this paper is uh, about a point that Pam mentioned earlier, is it possible to have a sui generis type of protection uh, for AI generated works? Uh, my answer is yes, and it is very desirable. So, um, uh, but before I delve into the details of sui generis protection, I wanna uh, start from distinguishing two type of AI generated works. First of all, uh, you know, uh, as Pam, uh, has shown, uh, you know, there are all kinds of, you know, works generated with human contributions. And this next Rembrandt uh, uh, project is exactly the perfect example. Uh, and so uh, then the second type uh, is concerned with works generated by auto autonomous AI systems. So for the second type, I think so far, the uh, answer is pretty clear cut. Uh, by looking at judicial decisions, um, they are not copyrightable. They should be placed in the public domain. Uh, for example, the monkey selfie case that uh, uh, speakers have mentioned, uh, uh, you know, rule that animals do not have statutory standing on the copyright law. And then the federal court of Australia actually uh, uh, has made it this point uh, more clear, okay, uh, by ruling that copyright law only involves the requirement for a human author 
or the existing of moral rights. So I'm going to focus on the protection of works generated with human contributions. Um, so uh, for this uh, type of works, the Chinese court has uh, recently hand down a decision, uh, this Tencent versus uh, Yingxun uh, case that Pam mentioned earlier. So I'm gonna uh, you know, uh, talk a little bit more about this case and then move on to deal with uh, sui generis protection. Okay. So in this case, uh, Tencent developed an AI-based robot reporter called Dream Writer. It can uh, create roughly 300,000 articles per year uh, so in, in this case, Dreamwriter produced an article on financial news. The defendant, Ying Xin, republished the article on his website without permission from Tencent. So the Chinese court, first of all, uh, dealt with a question about whether this AI-generated work uh, was copyrightable or not. So it applies the original, uh, originality doctrine, arguing that uh, the article was generated by the Dream Writer, uh, the Dream Writer AI system. Okay, at the same time, the article ref reflects the selection, analysis, and judgment of the relevant stock market information. It has a reasonable and expressive structure and clear logic, so it satisfies the second prong of the originality requirement, which uh, mandates that a work should has should have a minimal degree of creativity. So then the court uh, move on to deal with the human contribution element. Um, it recognizes that the process of creating the article involved, uh, involved 10 cents personalized choices and judgment and skills. So then we need to recognize their contribution. And the court also uh, ruled that the automatic operation of Dream Writer is not entirely independent by itself, nor the, uh, the AI system has, uh, you know, uh, self-consciousness. So this uh, automatic operation reflects 10 cent teams choices and is also determined by dream writers technical characteristics determined by the 10 cent team. So on, on, on the basis of this argument, the court ruled that 10 cent as the developer of the uh, dream writer should be uh, regarded as the copyright owner of this article. So it seems that if we take a look at, closer look at this case, it seems that uh, we have uh, sort of, you know, addressed the issue of how to protect works generated with human contributions, but I respectfully disagree with this argument because I think there are certain major problems with this Tencent ruling. So first of all, this ruling actually does not uh, differentiate AI-generated works from traditional works created by machines that do not have human intelligence, like cameras and computers. So there is no distinguishing, uh, uh, distinguishing efforts like that. And secondly, there is still a question about whether AI-generated works should enjoy full copyright protection as pictorial or computer generated works do. Um, then there, there comes another question about, uh, 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 about whether, you know, if uh, AI developers do not make the major intellectual contributions to AI generated works, should they enjoy full or limited copyright protection? Um, so to a certain extent it is the machine that make a major uh, contribution. So what shall we do? Okay. If it is if this is the case, then uh, you know how should copyright law be adjusted? So I uh, argue that we should create a sui generis right uh, in order to deal with these tricky issues. So before I present the case for sui generis right, I uh, want to mention that uh, copyright scholars have argued that you know AI systems are also machines. Their tool, their tools such as uh, cameras and computer uh, computers. So when uh, human beings apply those tools and then create works, then they should be protected as normal works. So this argument is actually also uh, quite problematic in my own opinion because um, um, first of all, uh, we need to uh, so you know. Uh, uh, 
uh, gain a deeper understanding of the nature of the AI system that have been applied to you create works. For example, machine learning uh, has been a, a major capacity of the AI system. So machine learning uh, techniques use deep neural networks with multiple layers between the input and output layers to emulate human brain, enabling an AI system to learn and to make decisions on its own. So current AI systems apply algorithm to automatically learn and to improve performance through experience by receiving feedback without being explicitly programmed. So uh, uh, equipped with machine learning, uh, advanced AI systems are actually different from the ordinary tools that we use to create uh, um, uh, works. Secondly, we need to understand that uh, um, uh, you know, uh, AI system actually you know, have uh, gained uh, increased sophistication in creating works. Uh, they have evolved into something other than a mere tool of human creators. They have been creating, for example, new styles that we human beings have, new styles of works that we human beings can uh, have not envisioned. And thirdly, I think we also need to think about the fixation requirement. Fixation is, uh, uh, is one of the requirements for copyright protection. Okay, so uh, in my opinion, we need to, uh, you know, have a closer look at this requirement and see whether AI system actually are, uh, are the, have to play the major role of fixing works in a tangible medium so that AI system from that perspective should be, uh, you know, regard as a um, you know, major, uh, you know, uh, uh, major, you know, uh, media through which we fix works in the tangible medium so that uh, so we enable works uh, uh, so that we trigger copyright protection. So this is another thing we have to bear in mind. So how, how to introduce a sui generis uh, protection system to deal with AI generated works with human contributions then. Uh, so first of all, I, uh, we need to bear in mind that sui generis protection has been applied to uh, certain kinds of intellectual property uh, creations such as mask works, vessel how designs, fashion designs, uh, plant varieties and databases. So this system is already in place. It's a matter of how we apply it. Uh, to deal with the current problems. Uh, so first of all, if we create a new sui generis right to protect AI generated works with human contribution, I think we need to have the following five key elements for this new system. First of all, we will still apply the originality requirement to see whether AI generated works should be protected or not. So this will still be applied. And secondly, the bundle of economic rights for traditional copyrighted works should also be conferred upon sui generis rights holders of AI generated works. But thirdly, more rights, in my opinion, should not be uh, bestowed upon sui generis rights holder of AI generated works. And fourthly, um, I argue that the new sui generis right for AI generated works should only last for 10 years. Um, it should not last for the life of the author plus uh, fi uh, 70 years. Uh, so this is too long in, a, in my own opinion, okay. And last but not least, the new sui generis rights should guard only against the verbatim copying of AI generated works. So in normal uh, copyright in infringement cases, we apply the substantial similarity standard, right? Okay. But it, in, uh, in the case of AI generated works, I argue that we should apply the verbatim copying standard. So putting all these together, you can see that we actually, uh, if we got, uh, if we were uh, gonna uh, protect AI generated works, we gonna provide lesser degree of protection. For example, uh, term of protection only lasts for 10 years. And we also apply the verbatim copying standards. So the lesser degree of protection actually allows more AI generated works to flow into pu the public domain uh, as soon as possible. So uh, I'm gonna wrap up by uh, a cautionary note. 
So how there, then we actually, if we have this system, but then we still have a, to deal with a potential problem of how we can identify works generated by AI system. For the time being, I think it's very easy for us to figure it out because people are very excited to announce that they have uh, you know, AI generated works. But if we provide AI generated works with lesser degree of protection, chances are they might not be that enthusiastic. They might be hiding this kind of AI creation status. So what shall we, uh, what shall we do then? I suggest that we should create a very uh, verification system which will require AI system developers or users to publicize the generation of their works by AI systems. So a public statement should be attached on those type, types of works saying that they were created by AI system. Okay, so if they failed to fulfill this requirement, we uh, can impose uh, civil penalties upon the party, the relevant parties those civil penalties could uh, include, for example, a fine or a public apology. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much, Hao Chen. Uh, Professor Karis Craig, you are up. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and, uh, and thank you very much. Thanks for, for sticking around for this. And, uh, Many thanks to um, Haoshan for the invitation to participate. It is getting late here in Toronto, midnight approaches, and uh, there are a few people who could keep me alert and engaged in an academic conversation um, as midnight draws near, but if anybody can, uh, these are the people and this is the conversation, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, what I want to do here is, is draw um, my comments from a chapter that I've just finished writing for Ryan Abbott's forthcoming research handbook on AI and IP. And that really builds on work that I've done elsewhere on AI authorship, so-called. And I want to pull that together as well with some other work on technological neutrality. So thinking about how we should be approaching the kind of legal policy questions that are provoked by new technologies uh, like AI. So it does indeed seem that the um, age of AI has finally arrived and um, that the rise of the machines is upon us. And now, of course, um, we're told that they come to us not as conquerors, but as creators. And, and that's because, as we've heard, um, AI has become capable of generating new works that have all of the kind of external hallmarks of original creative expression, which makes them sort of facially indistinguishable, at least, from works of human authorship. So we've already seen some of the go-to examples here that will be familiar to people, the portrait of Eamon Bellamy, for example, Another one that I talk about is the 2016 sci-fi movie Sunspring, which was written by an AI that was trained on a bunch of sort of 1980s and 90s sci-fi screenplays. And it was a kind of surrealist um, script in the end, but it landed like the top 10 place in a London sci-fi film festival. Um, there are also, of course, many more mundane examples of basic machine-generated um, text, so produced by chatbots online or images from um, Google's Deep Dream AI uh, selfies. We have music uh, from Spotify's kind of, if we're honest, monotonous AI composed playlists, um, all the way to Schubert's now um, apparently finished uh, Symphony Number no. 8. And as with any new wave of innovative activity, um, especially if it has commercial applications, if it has commodifiable outputs, the question has quickly become who owns this stuff, right? So I think a more apt question though is whether anyone owns it. And in fact, for copyright purposes, the first question we should ask is whether there's even an original creative work here to be owned. As things stand, as we've heard, 
Um, works that are autonomously generated by machines or AI are not copyrightable in most jurisdictions around the world. So in the US, um, reliance on the Constitution and vice and the originality doctrine tell us that we need a human author or a natural person. The same is actually um, true based upon the originality jurisprudence in Australia and in Canada and in most of Europe. Um, we do have, and we've spoken about some jurisdictions, the UK most notably, that has provisions that mean that, um, that deem authorship, right, in uh, the person who's responsible for making the arrangements that are necessary for the creation of the computer generated work. Although even in those cases, whether the works actually meet the threshold of originality and protectability is often still an open question. It seems clear, though, that we are at this kind of critical moment now in the evolution of the law, where policymakers, again, around the world are turning their attention to this question and asking about whether they need to amend copyright, whether they need to redesign IP um, to ensure the protection of AI generated works. And they're wondering whether if they don't, they're going to fall behind in the global competition over AI innovation. So there have actually been several high profile public consultations as well around the world in the U EU, in the UK, and now currently in Canada, all sort of putting these questions to the public and to experts. How, um, how should copyright respond to the rise of AI? Well, I think IP is so ingrained in how we think about cultural and knowledge production and innovation policy that we're just used to thinking that if you invest effort um, and, and time and investment and of money and resources, that you should have a private entitlement that comes out of that. That if you add value to something, that you um, should acquire a right. And this is what Rochelle Dreyfus and others, Wendy Gordon, have criticized as the if value, then right proposition or, or fallacy. Right? And what it does is it produces the assumption that if AI generated works are socially and culturally valuable in some way, then they should be protected by IP. And certainly we're used to thinking that any kind of original expression that we encounter is and should be protected by copyright. But are these sound assumptions and do they extend or should they extend to AI generated works? Scholars have repeatedly warned that it's a damaging default to assume that IP simply expands to embrace the latest thing, and that that leads to this sort of unnecessary swelling of the IP system and to this sort of continual encroachment that we've seen of IP into the public domain, into our shared sort of cultural sphere. So I think it's just all too easy to assume that the law can continue to expand to cover new innovations just by extension, by analogy. Um, and I think this as well reflects a certain kind of approach to lawmaking and legal regulation in the face of new technologies um, that's premised on what I've called um, a formal idea of the principle of technological neutrality. Right, so the idea is that the law should simply extend to apply to new technologies without discriminating. Um, so if a technological activity is just functionally equivalent in its effect, to something we did before, then we should treat it the same way. So if AI generates works that are functionally equivalent to human authored works, we should treat them as such. And that's what I understand to be Ryan's argument about legal neutrality. Instead, what I suggest in my work is that lawmakers need to adopt a more substantive version of this principle. So it's kind of like what substantive equality is to formal equality. Right? So I argue that the default assumption should be that we're regulating new technologies with a view to the same public policy goals and values that have informed the law. So the thing that should be technologically neutral is the larger normative objectives of the law. So if the purpose of copyright law is to encourage authorship, to foster a vibrant public domain, then substantive tech neutrality means that we should apply copyright law to emerging technologies in a way that consistently advances these public purposes, right? We should be asking what approach to AI will encourage the kind of authorial, the kind of creative practices that we hope to foster um, in service of this vibrant public domain. As Barton um, previously suggested, 
AI could soon create this sort of post-scarcity world that's just replete with machine-generated cultural works. But the public goals of the copyright system, progress of the arts, uh, these have never been about mass production and the accumulation of cultural products in a vast sort of storehouse of intellectual commodities. They should be about encouraging the processes of creative practice, the exchange of ideas, or what Rosemary Kuhn would call a drive to meaning, right? So I think if nothing else, the arrival of AI has given us the reminder that maybe we needed of why authorship matters. And framed in this way, then the, the policy question becomes, would protecting AI generated works encourage the kind of creative practices that advance copyright's public policy goals? And my answer to that is no, absolutely not, <laughs> it wouldn't. And in fact, it would become an obstacle to authorship and to creative practices. And that's because what the AI is doing when it generates a work is not authorship. The AI is not an author. So I wrote this paper together with the late and, and sorely missed Ian Kerr called The Death of the AI Author. And Ian's work was really concerned with understanding AI and technology in social and relational contexts. So when he and I were talking about this sort of AI authorship quandary, he thought that people were maybe misunderstanding or mischaracterizing what it is that neural networks are actually doing when they create works, right? And, and I thought um, that people were sort of misunderstanding what authorship is and what copyright is supposed to do. And so together we argued that this whole concept of the AI author was really just a category mistake, that AIs are incapable of authorship properly understood. So I want to explain that a little bit more. Um, we know, and there's actually now like a lot of research that demonstrates that um, people are inclined to anthropomorphize robots, right? That we, we attribute uh, human characteristics and emotions to AI, and even AI researchers frequently do this with their own creations. So this example is Kismet, the robot who's being described as by researchers as showing surprise or having a happy expression. And of course, all it has is a sort of representation of a smile or a gasp. It's not showing or expressing anything at all never mind an actual feeling, right? But the rhetoric we use implies this kind of expressive agency, this kind of intentionality. So the point is when we say that the robot shows surprise, we're making a category mistake. AI is computational, intentions are not, these two things are ontologically different in important ways. Another example is these recent viral videos you may have seen of robots doing um, a dance to, I think it was, Do You Love Me? They were doing the mashed potato. Um, and I think this captures the same kind of concern. Right? People were saying people loved the robots dancing, but the robots were not moved by the music to dance, right? They weren't expressing their thoughts or feelings or desires through physical movement. They're just employing technical mechanical attributes of balance and motion, the same attributes that allow their deployment in war zones or in protests on public streets. Right? So the robot dog, Spot, apparently, of course, um, is just moving as it's trained to move, whether it's pointing a weapon at a human subject or it's doing the twist for the mashed potato. Right? It doesn't know the difference. And so what follows from this, I suggest, is that the robots are not really dancing at all. And it's a mistake to say that they're dancing. They're not capable of dancing because dancing is an expressive act. And when we imagine that robots are creative authors, we're making the same kind of category mistake. We're attributing to robots qualities of expressive agency, of intentionality, that they're simply not capable by their nature of possessing. So when a neural network writes a screenplay, it's simply predicting what words might logically be strung together into a sentence and then into a paragraph and another one, right? And it's definitely tempting to frame that ability to predict which words follow other words as an act of authorship, it might even look functionally equivalent to what authors do when they string words together. But as, as Ian wrote, it neither knows, understands, nor appreciates the connotation of the word assemblage. Right? Ryan Kahlo says, the box is gorged on data, but has no taste for meaning. 
Even more than just humanizing the AI though, we argued that we tend to romanticize it, by which we meant we applied to AI the sort of myth of the romantic author, the entirely independent, original creator, creating out of nothing, as um, Mario Klingerman suggests in this quote. Right? So what we're doing here is we're kind of attributing to AI some kind of omniscient, superior creative capacity in this narrative. And that in itself is invoking the old uh, romantic myth of the author as God, except now it's the AI author as God, right? The, the AI becomes in a sense the ideal author and the ideal independent originating entity um, from which of course springs this ownership claim. So not only does this overlook vast um, quantities of human expression and culture um, that are necessary to train the AI, the point is it also obscures the fact that AI is incapable of authorship properly understood. So what does this mean for copyright law if we take the proposive kind of approach that I was suggesting at the outset, right? That copyright law should encourage and reward creative authorship and foster a vibrant public domain above everything else. So what I'm suggesting is that AI works might look like works of human authorship and that the law can of course accommodate them as such if we choose to, but the mistake we mustn't make is to treat the AI as if it is an author, right? The good tech neutral policymaking should begin by seeing the AI uh, for what it is and what it's not. And that means recognizing that AI generated and human authored works are just fundamentally different in purpose and in kind. They just fit differently within the copyright scheme. And so I actually argue that AI works should be excluded from copyright, that they should remain in the public domain. Copyright should be limited to human authored works. I agree with what much of what Dan said earlier, there's just no demonstrable need to encourage their production. If we refuse to protect them, it's not like there's an author being denied their just reward. And the other thing to stress is, I'm not saying that the works then are without social value, right? When we allow them to circulate freely without restriction, um, they'll provide entertainment and inspiration and meaning they'll foster a vibrant public domain. But if we enclose them with intellectual property, we'll be creating a cultural domain that's cluttered by copyright interests that chills human authors who then have to create around all these vast quantities of machine generated works and trying to avoid the risks of algorithmically uh, identified copyright liability. Um, so I apply the same logic and I need not spend much time on it because it overlaps with much of what you heard um, already from Mark. The same logic to AI inputs, right? Just stressing that if we're concerned with works as works of authorship, then AI is not capable of receiving the communicative message. It's not an addressee of meaning. And we shouldn't concern ourselves with the reproduction of things um, functionally rather than with the exchange of meaning. So uh, I'll just maybe conclude by saying that the whole sort of fear that motivates this conversation is the fear that we have the wrong starting point. That when we combine romanticism about robots and complacency about the costs of copyright control, we're poised at this precipice and we might make some really critical errors that could actually harm human creators and users and the public interest. So I'll stop there, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Karis. You wanna stop the screen share there so we can... <clears throat> uh, okay, great, so I've got several questions that like multiple pages of notes that I got written down here, but I guess I thought might thought we maybe could start with, uh, there's some already conversation happening in the chat uh, uh, with the panelists interacting with each other and I might give everybody a chance to kind of react or ask questions to each other. Uh, okay, sure. I um, I want to quickly so you know uh, mention uh, 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 a a point about uh, AI and uh, person uh, the personhood of AI because uh, I want to draw uh, panelists and the audience to the uh, for example the environmentalism movement and animal rights protection movement. So these movements actually uh, go beyond this kind of human centric uh, ideas. Uh, for example, environment, environmentalists have argued that uh, we actually should give trees this 
the legal standing to uh, make lawsuits. Uh, so this kind of idea is kind of uh, important. And animal rights uh, you know, activists also are, argue that animals should have rights as well. So um, I, I think we should not take for granted that AI uh, would not have rights, but it, it's a matter of how we conceptualize everything. Um, is AI, for example, advanced enough to uh, take responsibilities that I mentioned earlier? So uh, technological development is one issue. And on the other hand, uh, we, so we, we need to keep our mind open enough to deal with um, um, uh, the potential recognition of AI personhood. Uh, so, uh, so I think we can draw some inspirations from the, uh, the, the, the movements that I mentioned earlier. So I don't think that we know anything about um, how much incentive anybody needs, how many intellectual property rights we need. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more leaning toward Karis's uh, uh, approach than uh, to uh, how Chen's. Uh, although, you know, the sui generis is better than full length copyright. I, I give you that. But part of the problem is that you know, the Copyright Office can't tell the difference between a, an AI generated work and, um, uh, and a work that a human uh, actually did. So there's a kind of practical and pragmatic issue um, that um, if they can't tell the difference and the person who wrote the program uh, can't tell the difference, I can't kind of say, oh, that's my AI output. Um, I, I just don't see how we can how we can give uh, the rights to uh, to somebody who ha you know who can't even like identify uh, what the work uh, what the work might be. So um, I in the article that I wrote um, uh, back in 1985, you know my 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 point of view was that you know the users are going to like basically say, okay, here are all these outputs. Most of them are not very useful, not very likely to be commercially successful. So, um, I'm going to like select these things and then I'm going to tinker with them a little bit, just like in that first um, uh, Chinese case that I mentioned. Um, and that's probably enough originality um, to support uh, a regular copyright. So as a kind of pragmatic matter, uh, I think the user who basically uh, fusses with, uh, um, with the output is probably, you know, as a pragmatic matter, going to going to be able to create some rights. And I just don't see how you can get people to basically um, admit that the expression in this particular thing came from the computer program. I just like they just won't do it as a as a practical matter. But I, I mean, I I feel like we are. I, 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 I see like Pam's concern that people might lie about this, but I guess I'm less worried about that um, uh, as a kind of general problem than as an occasional problem, right? I, to, to me, I, you're absolutely right. The outputs look identical. I think there is a vision of copyright law that says we got the output uh, and so we must protect it. But I'm with Karis on this. I think this is the wrong vision of copyright law, right? If we're, if we're doing anything here, uh, I think we are doing it because we, are, we need to do it, right? Uh, even though it costs us something in order to get uh, uh, works we wouldn't otherwise get. Uh, and when you take that pillar away, for me, I get off the, the train, right? Even people who don't agree with me on that and say, oh no, there's a moral right story. You've got to have a very strong uh, 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 conception of moral rights to, to say this is a circumstance where we ought to have a kind of moral or natural entitlement to copyright protection. Uh, so, I'm, you know, I, you know my, I guess my reaction to this was, uh, you, know, you know, kind of was, uh, uh, similar to the to the Naruto versus Slater reaction, I don't see what good it does to give a monkey a copyright uh, because I don't think it's going to motivate the monkey. 
Um, but the instinctive reaction of a lot of people who said, oh, the monkey can't have the copyright, which is, therefore, we must give the owner of the camera a copyright because, gosh, somebody's got to have it, seems to me exactly the wrong uh, instinct, right? The, 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 the default should not be who gets the right because somebody must have it, right? As Karis uh, uh, points out, right, the if value then right uh, story, right? The default should be, right, why do we need anything uh, what, that, that sort of limits or circumscribes our ability to do what we want with information that's come to us. Uh, I think I also that, that um, you know, I'm more sympathetic to the idea that um, if um, there is environmental damage uh, being done, um, uh, animals should have somebody should be able to represent the interests of animals that are basically uh, getting, uh, uh, you know, dying and, and getting really sick uh, because of uh, that environmental pollution. But to me, the sort of the animal rights argument for that um, doesn't translate over to the kind of AI generated works or to monkeys getting copyrights. I think it's important that we recognize to that point that what will be the outcome of this, right? Who's going to end up with these rights? It's inevitably going to be more corporate ownership of more cultural products, right? Like that's the sort of um, dilution of the public domain. That's the constant sort of encroachment that we've seen. And to Ruth's point earlier, this idea that we should learn from the way that we've seen IP constantly ratchet up create new rights over new subject matter every time something comes along of any value. Um, you know, what we should learn is that we need to kind of hold the line. Um, and I worry a little bit about, I mean, I understand the impulse behind the notion that we create a sui generis right that is much more carefully tailored, much more restrictive, and therefore we address the sense that we need to do something without giving up the whole sort of panoply of, of copyright interests that would otherwise be available. I worry that that's too convenient of a sort of step down position. And we're going to end up doing that. And then what we really have is just more proliferating rights. And it looks like a bit of, a, you know, another kind of land grab. And we, we've done that with so many neighboring rights and database rights. And, you know, we keep layering on more rights. And I just am very worried that that's where we're going to end up if we make that initial concession that we could create something sui generis. I was just going to say, if I could ask a question that's going to, I'm going to try to kind of weave a, a thread between a variety of these things. And that is to say, um, just to sort of flag how fundamentally it would have, we would have to reorient copyright law, not just in terms of ownership, but really in terms of pretty much every one of its foundational doctrines to think, what what would the concept of originality even mean in a world with, of AI production, right? So Houchin was talking about original, uh, limiting um, the sui generis right to original AI generated works, but in the copyright system, right, we've long under we've long treated originality as not at all being about novelty, right? It's entirely about the fact that it is independently created, and so we have we all teach this, right, that two works can be identical, but if they spring from two different creative authors, no matter their origin, no matter their identity on paper, they're both original works, right? So that we would have to fundamentally rethink the idea of originality. We would have to fundamentally rethink the idea of what, what it means to be an expressive work as opposed to a non-expressive work. And so that, so the thread is not just who owns it. it. It runs really deeply through all of copyright law that we would have to kind of rethink in order to orient, to, to make space for treating these things as if they were just widgets that we could interact with. I, I guess I'm not entirely persuaded of that, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm I am 90% with Karis on uh, on everything she says, but but to me, it's not. I I don't I, I don't see that we are um, sort of fundamentally doing something that's different. We might be doing something that's diff that, that you know for different reasons, and that to me matters. Um, but I, I think, frankly, we are well down the line that Mark suggests already, right? Uh, half of our um, uh, copyrighted works, if not more, are works made for hire. Uh, those works are generated by corporations. Corporations, as one science fiction author uh, mentioned, are actually our original AIs. We've had AIs for a couple centuries now. They're somewhat slower moving, but they are in pretty much all other respects like AIs. They are things originally generated by humans given certain 
certain algorithmic constraints, but sent off to do their own things. And humans can sort of uh, serve to try to constrain or control them, but they are going to maximize what they're going to maximize. Um, and we regularly treat them as authors. And in fact, we regularly modify our legal doctrines uh, to try to um, uh, uh, adapt what what starts out as this kind of conception of, of human genius and, and flourishing uh, to the reality that many of the things we want to give economic protection for are not things that look anything like what we originally thought of as copyright. So I don't know that it is too far a leap to say uh, we could declare these things to be copyrightable. I just don't think it's a good idea. The other thing is that originality is not that big of a hurdle in the United States. Uh, things that are distinguishable variations uh, from existing works um, uh, are often treated as copyright protectable. Um, a lot of the things that um, are um, works of low, uh, low authorship uh, that kind of have thin scope of protection um, uh, often, uh, you know, are going to be less uh, expressive than uh, a song that might have been uh, generated by uh, by a computer program. And the Copyright Office and the courts very often look to the artifact. They don't look to the process by which it's created. They don't look to the intent of the creator. They basically look at the artifact. And if the artifact is kind of like, you know, kind of has some expressive type features, you know, it's a picture, it's, um, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a collage of different kinds of things that kind of mash together. Uh, it seems to me that that's actually, um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm with you in spirit, Mark, with is like, oh, we have to fundamentally rethink this thing. But honestly, We've been working with uh, uh, works of low authorship for a really long time, um, and uh, it's not clear to me that uh, uh, that the Copyright Office will definitely hold um, if essentially the industry wants to move either toward a sui generis uh, or uh, toward a copyright regime uh, for AI generated stuff. Um uh, let me jump in with a general note. I think it's important to differentiate between AI generated works with human contribution and without human contribution. It's possible that we, we can develop autonomous AI uh, systems. So at that point, uh, we, uh, so then the question is, shall we still protect works created by autonomous AI systems? But for the time being, as, as I mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chinese court, for example, has protected uh, AI works uh, created uh, by, uh, the AI was created with human contribution. So uh, I think the, the ruling, this ruling actually uh, gives, sheds light on how we can deal with, uh, you know, cases of similar nature. And, uh, but my only observation for, uh, reservation for that ruling is that, uh, if we uh, uh, wholeheartedly accept that ruling, that then uh, the, the chance is that we might uh, give too much copyright protection to uh, the AI system developers. And also, uh, as uh, Karis pointed out, and there's a concern about the dilution of the public domain. So how can we deal with it? I think we, it's, um, uh, we need to think about how we should adjust it. For example, existing, copyright regime, or we can introduce a uh, sui generis right. But as Pam pointed out, it might be a little bit problematic. Uh, so I, I'll keep thinking about that. Thank you, Pam. So, so I, I just want to sort of uh, uh, talk a little bit about that point, right? Because I do think it's, Pam mentioned earlier, like, look, the originality standard is really low, right? What we're going to end up saying is, even though the thing that people care about in this uh, was generated by the operation of an algorithm, which itself has uh, uh, self-adapted and learned in such a way that I couldn't have told it to do this or predicted it would do this. I'm going to come in at the, at the final uh, turn and do a little bit of tweaks, uh, the sort of Photoshopping equivalent, and then we'll say, ah, look, a human has participated. But I worry that if we do that, um, uh, right, our, our instinct will be, right, to say, uh, oh, well, yeah, the entirety of the work is in fact sort of attributable to that human creator because 
it's the only author looking person or entity we can find. Uh, and that is a fundamental mismatch from what value we should give it. Even if you want to say our, our low originality standard is enough and thank you for tweaking some of the color values on this uh, uh, image that has been generated by an AI, right? We shouldn't be saying you get to own the image itself, right? Because you didn't actually generate that. And I don't think it would be a huge step for us to extend this. In fact, I think it's like the next logical step. But I guess what I mean is that this is a moment in time where it could be a corrective, right? Like if extending copyright to these kinds of works is taking the mistakes we've already made to their logical conclusion, then maybe this is a moment um, to, to draw the line. And maybe to back up a little yeah. bit and actually give some more substance to our originality standard and recognize what we mean by authorship because we've neglected that for too long. And, and maybe just to add to that, just to say that, you know, the history suggests that if the battle lines here are fought entirely in terms of whether we have enough economic incentive, then the ship has sailed, right? Because they because that will be won by the interests that are looking for more protection. Um, I just want to uh, note that there, in the in the sort of panelist chat, there's an interesting discussion going on between the the Dan slash Daniels, um, uh, right? Uh, so, I, and um, on the on the sort of question of whether or not there's sort of ever, in fact. Um, uh, autonomous systems, right, or or they're sort of all traced to human contributions. I mean, I think at some at some base point, of course, everything starts with a human contribution. Uh, but as Daniel Gervais uh, suggests, right, it might not do so in a legally useful uh, proximate cause sense, right? Uh, the fact that I pushed the button that started the thing going, that generated something that I never had any conception of. Uh, and could not possibly have created on my own. Uh, even if I am the human uh, originator of that thing in some sense, that's not a sense that the law normally would or should view as uh, something that I get rights over, right? And so I think that does leave us with the sort of residual question of what happens to it, right? And you can say, uh, we give it to the human anyway because they push the button. You could say uh, we give it to the AI and declare it, uh, uh, the, declare it the owner, although I think that begs the question of sort of who has the economic rights around the AI. Or you could say, which is my preference, right, this is not something sufficiently closely connected to an act of human authorship that any human being uh, is entitled to claim ownership over. It. Well, uh, <clears throat> Go ahead, Hachan. I think you said we. I think we may have exhausted the question. So, yeah. Okay. Or, or okay. the panelists. <clears throat> yeah. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, would you like to pick some questions from the Q and A box, or shall we keep the conversation going? Um. Well, I mean, so that's the last couple of questions that came in in the Q and A box are kind of along those lines, which is like how would we pick a standard for the the amount of human in, involvement or control that would be necessary and which is what i think what mark was just was just sort of uh, addressing and uh, but maybe others have thoughts on that too as if if you know if there was going to be some kind of legal uh maybe, maybe Hodgson, this is actually maybe addressed to you and and your proposal but if there was going to be you know some threshold amount of human involvement that's necessary how would you find an administratable standard there administrable um, I think uh, the key issue is to uh, identify who is the developer of um, uh, the AI system. In most of cases, I mean, uh, for the time being, it is, uh, you know, normally the AI system developer that will be regarded as the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the party that making this so-called human contribution. But in reality, it's gonna be more con uh, complicated. We also have users. Users of AI system that may uh, be creating uh, works with, with the aid of AI system. So I think with the uh, you know increased use of AI system, and then uh, the the situation will be a lot more complicated. And uh, so to a certain extent, it's uh, the the Chinese court's ruling has shed light uh, you know on this issue. But somehow 
if we uh, take a closer look at the more practical issues, uh, for example, with the AI system user involved, and then the whole thing will be more complicated. And uh, so uh, the major crime, if we're gonna go with the Chinese court's rule in this path, the, the major, I think, thing is, uh, the major standard is gonna take a look at uh, to what extent the, uh, the AI system uh, has been developed and uh, used by uh, human beings. Um, so, uh, but then I would like to also uh, draw us attention to uh, pictorial works. So if we use cameras to take pictures, it's just a matter of press, uh, it's a matter of pressing the button and then adjust it a, a little bit angle, right? It, normally it's easy, right? Uh, it's automatic process, but we uh, normally we ground, uh, you know, copyright to the photo uh, photographers, uh, those who take, uh, use the camera to take photos. So um, if we draw that analogy, it seems to me that the Chinese court ruling has, uh, so you know, uh, provided a useful approach to uh, dealing with uh, these problems. If we're interested in another topic, I'm not sure how long you want to go. But one thing, the thing I skipped over at the end of the talk, but I, I kind of wanted to go back to was the question of the AI as reader. Uh, we've talked a lot about the AI as author, but the AI and its use of, um, of human creativity and human cultural products in its own training. And, you know, this is the point about recognizing the human inputs into AI and not invisibilizing all of the sort of cultural material that flows into training AI and then sort of venerating the machine as though it's somehow independent of those inputs. Um, but that, in, to my mind, doesn't turn into recognizing that the human author's rights are being infringed when the AI is being trained, right? Quite the opposite. What we're trying to, what I'm trying to stress anyway, is that when you understand that the reason we care about works of authorship and want to encourage them is because we want people to engage in this sort of expressive, creative practice, then we have to understand that what the AI is doing when it's being trained is not that, right? The work is not being used as a work of authorship. Um, it is what Pam and Matt Sag have called like the non-expressive use. And if that's the case, I don't know, and this might be a question for Mark, whether we have to go to fair use um, to excuse the use, or we could say it just simply doesn't implicate copyright and the reproduction right in the first instance. So I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about what people think of that. I mean, I'm, like, I'm open to that idea. I think the problem is, right, that as it stands right now, anything a computer does makes multiple copies, right? And so I don't think it's actually, we, that probably is a sign that we should redefine what we mean to be a copy because we've written it uh, uh, for an era and a set of technologies that doesn't relate uh, terribly well to, uh, uh, to the modern world, right? But as we define it in the modern world, right? Um, uh, right ingestion, reading, right? Sort of uh, learning the ideas from, um, often when humans do it, if, it's in, if a computer is involved, Right, uh, but certainly when a when a computer does it is going to involve the making of those copies, right? Uh, and and that starts the whole apparatus. It turns it on, and it means therefore you know somebody's got to pay, unless we've got an a, an exemption like fair use. So I I actually taught um, uh, AI authorship today in my copyright class because um, I've been teaching who is an author, and I showed them the. Uh, the Rembrandt um, uh, material, and I'd sent them the link to the next Rembrandt um, uh, video. And I was astonished at how many different answers there were to that question. And one thing that I, I will sort of uh, uh, say here is people have been thinking about this for like more than 50 years, uh, and we still actually don't have consensus about it. And I think that's just interesting. Well, that was before we had this webinar, Pam. So now <laughs> we'll probably. Oh, yeah. No, it. I think oh, we yeah. came oh. around with a lot of consensus here. Uh -uh. Yeah. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I think we're 
probably headed to the end here. Okay, okay great. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar. And uh, I feel as if uh, we were creating a AN and IP Rembrandt project. And uh, this is great. And uh, I want to thank every panelist for giving such fabulous talks. And uh, I also want to thank uh, two moderators uh, for moderating the panels. And, uh, and the final thanks go to our attendees. Uh, thank you for uh, staying with us. And so hopefully we will have another event on AI and IP. And uh, so uh, see you guys soon. Have a good day or have a good night. I, I assume this means that Zoom owns the copyright in this uh, in this uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made contribution. We uh, may be copyright owners of our uh, webinar. Thank Good you. Idea. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks so very much, Richard. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.